greet the church in the wonderful name of our Lord and soon coming King Jesus. And I certainly hope that we are all doing well and keeping safe under the circumstances that we find ourselves in. I want to thank you for having me and I want to thank you for welcoming me into your homes. Without um, wasting much of your time, I ask us to take our Bibles and together we read from the book of 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17 and from 1 Kings chapter 17 we will read verse 1 until verse 16. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And I, it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, Indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And she, as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour, of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar, and see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first, and bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and, her, and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, which he spoke by Elijah. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. May we just close our eyes and pray together. <coughs> our God and our Father in heaven, we want to thank you, dear God, for the reading of your word. And we ask, dear Master, that um, for the next few minutes you may speak to us in a way that you'd want us to know and understand you. In Christ's name we have prayed. Amen. Uh, the book of 1 Kings chapter 17 introduces us to a man called Elijah. And uh, the introduction of Elijah is very interesting in that it does not follow a typical introduction of a man in the Bible. The Bible just out of nowhere says that Elijah the Tishbite says to Ahab. But before we get into what Elijah starts to say, we must understand where Elijah is coming from and where his prophecy is coming from. The Bible says that Ahab was one of the kings of Israel. He had just become a king in Israel in Samaria particularly. And when he becomes a king, the Bible says he causes the people of Israel to sin. And more than that, the chapter 16, the Bible says that Ahab caused Israel to sin more than any other king in Israel had ever caused Israel to sin. The Bible further says that Ahab caused God to, God, forced God into anger more than any other person had ever angered God. The Bible then says to further anger God, uh, um, 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 Ahab goes and marries a woman by the name Jezebel from the land of Sidon. 
And when he marries Jezebel, he further builds a temple for Baal in the city of God, that is Samaria. And he puts up a temple there and causes Israel to continue worshipping uh, uh, Baal even in the land of their forefathers, in the land of Israel. And so the Bible says, then, then Elisha, the Tishbite, shows up and says to Ahab that as far as, as, as the Lord lives, and as far as he is concerned, there shall be no rain nor dew until the day the Lord, through him, Elijah, pronounces that there shall be rain. And the Bible says when Elijah had done making this announcement, then the word of the Lord comes up to him. And it says to him, um, get up from this place that is Samaria and move and go to the brook that is Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And when you arrive at that place, you shall drink from that brook. And the Lord then says to Elijah that I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. But before we get into the story of the ravens feeding Elijah, one person may ask themselves a question. Why is the Lord moving Elijah from Samaria and taking him to the brook that is Cherith? Uh, the book of uh, 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 4, there the Bible says that Jezebel had began to slaughter the prophets of Israel, each and every prophet that prophesied against Ahab and prophesied against Jezebel, Jezebel would slaughter. So the, the easiest assumption, therefore, we can take from the text is that when God moves Elijah from, 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 from Samaria and takes him to the brook Sherith, God is actually protecting his prophet. And the question is, why is then God moving this man and protecting him and leaving the rest? And I want to suggest that God is moving um, uh, um, God is moving Elijah to the city or to the brook of Cherith because of the words that came from Elijah. Elijah says to Ahab, if I don't say that there shall be rain in this place, then there shall not be rain in this place. So in other words, until Elijah himself announces the rain, there shall not be rain. If Elijah is killed before he announces the arrival of the rain, then there shall never be rain. God is using Elijah as a vessel for the, for the proclamation of this news. So if Elijah dies, then it means Israel will remain in its, its famine position, in its poverty, until such time maybe another prophet arises, I don't know. But the protection that God gives to this man is for this very reason, that it is he who brought the prophecy to, him to start with, and as a result, it should be he who finishes up the prophecy. And so the Bible says, then the word of the Lord comes up to him and says to him, move from Samaria and go into the land that is, to, to the brook that is by Cherith, and there you shall drink. And, and I want us to follow the, the sequence of the story there. The Bible says, God moves Elijah and says to him, go to the brook that is Cherith and drink from it. And God then says, I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. And then the Bible says the ravens were faithful in bringing Elijah bread and, and, and meat in the morning, bread and meat in the evening. But unfortunately, in the process of this providence from God, the brook dries up because the Bible says there had been no rain in the land. But when the brook dries up, God then says to Elijah, now that the brook has dried up, it is not time for you to move from this place and go to the land of Zarephath that is in Sidon. And God then says to Elijah that even in Zarephath, I have commanded a widow to provide for you there. And when he arrives in Zarephath, he is met by a dire situation. The widow says, I have nothing to give you. But the Lord speaks to Elijah and says to him, through this little that this woman have. The Lord says, it shall never run dry until such time 
I announce that there shall be rain on the land. Please follow the movement and the sequence of things as they happen. One thing that captures my attention about the movement of Elijah here, which brings me to my, to my first point, what captures my attention is that God seems to be proactive in Elijah's life when he says to him, move from Samaria and go to the brook of Cherith. God says, I have commanded not that I will command. In other words, when Elijah arrives in Cherith, providence waits for him there. So when Elijah arrives in Cherith, God is not planning to speak to the ravens. God has already spoken to the ravens. When Elijah moves from, from, from Cherith and goes to Zarephath, God does not plan to speak to the widow, God has already spoken to the widow. So when El every place Elijah arrives, God has already sorted it out. When Elijah arrives in the place, all he has to do is sit and wait and see how the Lord is going to do in his life. God is always proactive in providing for his people. And I guess that is the message that I want to send out to you, that God is always a step ahead of you. That every time you move from one place to the next, God has all, listen to me and listen to me very well. There's no place you will go where God has never been. There's no place your foot will trod where God's feet have never trodden. So when we faced with challenges like we are faced with them today, when we, have in, we are sitting in places where we don't know what's going to happen, I want to suggest to you that God is always a step ahead of us. Let us just move. The Bible says God says to Elijah, move, and Elijah moves. He believed that this God that he serves will prepare. In fact, amen. Oh God has prepared. And the Bible says when she, he arrives at the brook of Cherith, there is water ready for him. He drinks from it. The ravens bring him food. He eats from there. And, and like I said, it, it, it was not God's plan to speak to the ravens. The ravens, well, imagine this with me, that Elijah arrives in the place on a Friday night and on a Saturday morning when he wakes up, he finds a raven ready with the provision that the Lord had promised him. I want to start also by saying that God is faithful to his word only if we are faithful ourselves to listen and move as God tells us to move. The Bible says, God says to him, I have instructed ravens there the ravens are ready and they are prepared. Nobody knows where they are going to get that meat. Nobody knows if it is prepared or what. But fact of life is that God has prepared it. So when Elijah arrives in the brook by the brook of Cherith, everything is set up for him. And I want to say to you today that when the Lord asks you to move, move, God knows what he's doing. God does not plan to. In fact, this reminds me of a few years ago when I was starting to preach and I, 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 I discovered that a lot of people love this text in the book of Jeremiah 29 that says, uh, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you. So, and I wanted to understand what, what is it that God knows? And when I studied the, 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 the text itself, I discovered that the word know in the Hebrew, it's yada, which speaks to experiential knowledge, not passive knowledge. So when God says to Elijah, when, 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 when God says to Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you, he says to Elijah, I handled the plans myself. I touched the plans myself. I put them together myself. In other words, where you are going, the plans, I don't plan to make the plans. The plans are made already. I have handled them. You, when you speak to Michelle Obama, for example, and you say to her, do you know Barack Obama? Michelle will say, yes, I know him. Have you touched Barack Obama, yes, I have touched him. But when you ask me about Barack and you say, do you know Barack Obama? I'll tell you, yes, I know him. But where do you know him from? From TV. But the difference between me and Michelle is that Michelle has handled Barack. She has touched him. And that is the knowledge that God speaks of when he says, I know the plans I have for you. He means that he has handled them. So in other words, where you are going, God is coming from that direction. Where you have been, where you are going, God has been. I can push it a bit further and say to you that your future 
is the path to God because he is coming from where you are going. So there is no need for us to worry about anything. When the Lord says, I have instructed them to feed you when you arrive, please take him at his word. And the Bible says he moves and goes to that brook that is called Cherith. And when he arrives there, the food gets finished. But guess what? That is not the end of the story. That when water runs dry, God then looks at the man and says, I don't know what to do. But God says, no, no, no. Move from this place and go to another place where I have prepared a widow who is going to provide for you. Ah, please, please follow this story very well. When he moves from Cherith and goes to um, 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 Zerapath, a woman is prepared. God, like I've been saying, God is not going to speak to this woman, but God has already spoken to the woman. And when he gets to the, the, this place, when he arrives at this place, he says to this woman, please give me this and that, but that's not where we are. We are still here at this point. That he moves from Cherith, goes to Zerapath, and when he arrives at Zerapath, uh, he finds that there is another challenge. But before we get to the challenge of Zerapath, there is also this thing that I want us to pick up from. Number, the point number two that I want us to pick up from this story is the manner in which God provides. Point number one, God is always proactive in taking care of his people. God is always proactive in providing for his people. There is no place we will go where God has never been. Number two, the Bible says that when he speaks to Elijah, he says to him, I have instructed ravens to feed you. Please follow this story. I have instructed ravens to feed you. When he is done, he says to him, move from Cherith and go to Zerapath, which is in Sidon. Number three, he says, there is a widow there that will feed you. All these things, that these measures that God is using to provide for Elijah, not only are they creative, but somehow they have a sense of awkwardness. God provides for us in ways we will never imagine. When you read the book of Leviticus, chapter 11, verse 15, the book will tell you that ravens, all types of ravens, are considered unclean by God. But at this point, God chooses to use an unclean animal to take care of his prophet. It's amazing that God is able to feed you, even using that which in your eyes is considered unclean. God is able to use me, who in your eyes is the chief of sinners. But God decides that even through this dirty vessel, my people will have something to eat. Number two, the Bible says, then he says to him, go to Zerapath. Now, when you read chapter 16, verse 31, Zerapath is in Sidon, right? But when you read chapter um, 16, verse 31, you learn that the woman that Elijah is, I mean, Ahab is married to, that is Jezebel, is a citizen of Sidon. And when we have established already that God is actually taking Elijah and, uh, and, and helping him to escape the wrath of, of Jezebel. Jezebel wants to kill this man. But what then does God do? God takes Elijah and goes and hides him in the enemy's camp. He takes him to Sidon where Jezebel herself was raised and has grown up. God moves him and takes him to that place. It should be shocking that God will take you to the place of the enemy to even hide you from the very same people that want to kill you. Some of us have worked and have stayed in churches where God has protected us even from the people that are within that are trying to destroy us. That's the nature of God that he hides you in plain sight. But that is not the end of it. Then he says, there's a widow there that will provide for you. Now you must understand that during the times of Elijah and them, widows, when the Bible says she was a widow, the Bible is basically saying she was poor. 
Generally because women during that time, their place was literally in the kitchen, liter in its literal sense. So when a man, when this woman's husband dies, she automatically becomes poor because there is no man to provide for, um, for her and the family. But what shocks you then is that then God says that this very woman who is poor is going to be part of the greater and grand scheme of taking care of you. And I want to say to each and every one of us, God sometimes breaks his own protocols to take care of the needs of his people. God sometimes will provide for you in manners you never yourself ever imagined. The problem with Christians today is that we have boxed God. That when we can provide ourselves until this point, we assume that where we have come to the end of our own provision, it is also where God comes to the end. But here is a beautiful story. The woman says to this man that I have nothing to eat. When she reaches the end of the resources, then God starts a new chapter in her life. When we have come, the song says, to the end of our own resources, then our Father's full giving is only beginning, it has only begun. When we have come to the end of our resources, then God steps in. Amen. Let me put it this way. Your problems are the stage on which God performs the best. You see, when, when you are in trouble, it is there where God performs like he has never performed before. When you are good and well, when you are rich and well, you will never see the need for God's performance. But when you are at the end of your resources, then you see God standing up and saying, this cannot be the end of my child. The Ellen White says, there are a thousand ways in which can, God can provide for his people, of which we know nothing about. And I am here to suggest to you that God God will use ravens, the very things you assume are dirty, God will use them to feed you. God will hide you in the very places where you don't want to be hidden. God will use the same people that you look down on to provide for you. There are thousands of ways in which God can take care of us and we know nothing of them. And I'm simply here to suggest that God is very creative and uh, in the way he takes care of his people. And I must also say that uh, when we were young, we used to sing songs. I can't mention the name of the song, but the, con the, the basic line, uh, line of the song was that you can't, you can't confirm me. And the same story, is, it comes with regard to God. You cannot confirm him that when you expect it to come from this direction, it will come from an unexpected direction. And I'm simply saying to you, don't box God. God, during these times of COVID-19 and stuff like that, God will provide for you in ways and means you had never imagined. In fact, let me start by saying, stop imagining how God is going to perform his miracles in your life. You will never confirm him. Things can come from directions you never expected. Don't confirm God. The, God, the way God does things is very amazing. Number one, God is always proactive in our lives. There is no place you will ever go where God has never been. Number two, God will provide for you in ways you, can, you, have, you had never imagined. Stop even trying to imagine how God will take care of you. You can't. You will never confirm him. And we get into the story where now Elijah meets up with this woman. <clears throat> Pardon me. Elijah meets up with this woman and he says to her, please, Give me something to eat. And the woman says to the man of God, I have nothing to eat. I have nothing to give you. What I have is a little flour in my bin and a little oil in my jar. And all these I have, I'm collecting sticks as you may see. And these sticks I'm collecting so that I may go and cook for me and my son to eat. And when we have eaten, we are going to die. The emphasis is on dying. This woman is basically saying to Elijah, this is the end of me. When we have eaten from here, from this little that we have, when we have eaten, there is nowhere we are going to get food anymore. There is no place where we will get resources anymore. This is the end of it. When we have eaten from this, we are done. 
Then Elijah says to her, as the God of Israel lives, this is what he says to you and me, that the flour in your bin and the oil in your jar, they will never run out until the Lord speaks and says, there shall be rain in the land. Please follow the story now very carefully. Use your imagination together with me. The Bible says that when <clears throat> Elijah had said this to this woman, then she went and prepared food as Elijah had said. And what is amazing about the story is that the Bible then continues to say that this woman and her family began to eat for many days and the bean never dried up and the oil never dried up. But what I want us to also pick up from here is that God did not promise an overflow of flour and an overflow of oil. God only promised that it will never run dry. God never promised that it will be in abundance. What God had promised is that it will be enough for the day. So every morning when she wakes up, there is bread, there is, there is flour in the bin, there is oil in the bin, in the, in the jar. Every morning when she goes into her kitchen, she finds that what she has yesterday is still enough even today so when when sometimes in life i want to say we miss god's greatness uh, let me put it this way sometimes god's greatest miracles are noticed in the most smallest of things that he does sometimes we miss big promises or big blessings because we have focused our attention on bigger things it would have been nicer if the woman was to wake up on a sunday morning and find that her living room has stacks and stacks of flour but there was no such thing so she wakes up every morning with the belief that this God of Elijah has provided enough for me to eat today. So what this then teaches this woman is to daily depend on God for the day's provision. When she has enough, she will forget where it comes from. But God teaches her a lesson that I will give you enough for today. And when you have had enough for today, wake up tomorrow and look up to me for tomorrow's providence. The next day, ah man, every morning when she wakes up, she experiences grace. She is not supposed to have what she has. Every morning when she wakes up, she experiences mercy. She's not supposed to be where she is. Every morning when she wakes up, she experiences love. No, she is not supposed to be where she is. So every morning a song says, new mercies I see. Every morning there is something in the bin. Every morning there is something in the oil. And she is thankful to God because she has enough for the day. And I want to say to each and every one of us, sometimes God does just that. He gives us enough for the day. And we miss it at that, at that point. That when, when God does small things in our lives, we don't imagine them as coming from God because we think God's greatness must equal the acts of his... I mean, we think that because he's great, he must perform great things in our lives. I want to say to you, make peace with the fact that God will provide enough for you to last you for the day. Tomorrow, Focus on God some more. He will provide even for the day. The Bible says that this woman began to eat for many days together with her family. They never ran out of resources. God daily provided for her. God is an amazing God. And I want to conclude this by saying to you that may the God of providence extend the little that you have in your cupboard. I know that most of us at this time, at this time of these COVID 19s, our businesses are not functioning very well. We are at the end of our resources. But I want to say, may God extend whatever little is in your account that it may help you to survive until such time there is rain in the land. I know some of us have experienced salary cuts. And I want to say to each and every one of us that the little that you have in your bank account, the little that you have in your pocket, may God extend it until such time there is rain again on the land. Some of us have, have been fired from our jobs. We have lost our jobs because of this pandemic. But I want to say to each and every one of us, may God extend whatever little we have in our pockets until such time there is rain again in the land. I want to say to each and every one of us, God saw this day coming from a distance. 
I said it in, in my first point that God is proactive. That God is always ahead of us. He saw this thing coming and God will not let you die out of the situation. God is always proactive. The, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, then God. While the young man had taken away his stuff and ran away, when he was coming back home, God was waiting at the gate. And I'm simply here to say that God will extend whatever little that we may have. Number one, please be assured of this one thing that I say to you. God is proactive in our lives. God is always a step ahead of us. Number two, don't confirm him. God will provide for you in ways that you have never imagined. Some, some, God will use our enemies to feed us. It comes from God. Be prepared even for that. And the last, God will continue to sustain us through the little that we have in our cupboards. May the Lord help us and may the Lord bless us during this time. Shall we close our eyes as we pray together? <clears throat> our God and our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the reading of your word that we believe is also even relevant in our day and age. Dear God, as I pray now, there are some of your people who have businesses that are not fully functional because of these circumstances that we find ourselves in. But I pray, dear God, that you may sustain their businesses through the little that they have. There are those of us who have suffered salary cuts, job losses, and the likes, and we don't know how we are going to continue to take care of ourselves and the take care of our families. But we pray, dear God, and ask that may this little that we have in our cups, may this little that we have in our bins, may this little that we have in our cupboards, may this little that we have in our, in our, <coughs> in our bank accounts, may it help us and extend us. May it keep us until such time we shall send rain again. We pray that when all things have been said and done, your name may be glorified for the wonderful things that you have done in our lives. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.